Blessings, blessings, blessings. This is Minister Y. I'm glad you could be back with us today. Um, just do me a favor. If you would uh, like this video, share this video, and uh, subscribe if you're new. Um, that would be greatly appreciated. I think uh, some of this information needs to get out. Not that, you know, I'm 100% truth. I don't believe that. Um, I do believe in progressive revelation. Um, and so it's kind of important, though, that the data gets out there, though. Um, and so we've talked about uh, the name of the creator, yod heh -Vah -Vah, um, And we've talked about the sacred name movement. We talked about uh, their uh, position on the name of Jesus. And so today I want to continue with the worship doctrine. Um, and we're going to be talking about the deity or the Godhood of Yeshua. So, so um, today what we're going to do is we're going to look at the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments. So in Judaism, the uh, Ten Commandments is not referred to as the Ten Commandments they are called the 10 declarations. Uh, in Christianity, they're, they're called the 10, um, they're called the 10 commandments because they start with the second commandment as the first and they break up the second commandment uh, into two commandments. But the Jews start with the first declaration, which is I am Yahweh who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Everybody should know the rest then. The second commandment is, you should have no other gods before me. You should not make an image uh, carved in any likeness uh, or image. You should not bow down to any likeness or image. Continuing from there, you should, take, you should not take the name of Yahweh in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You should not murder. You should not commit adultery. You should not steal. You should not bear false witness against your neighbor, and you should not covenant anything that belongs to your neighbor. We all know what the Ten Commandments are, right? But there is something here that we do not consider, especially coming out, out of Christianity. Okay? We don't consider the meaning of these commandments. And so I want to break this down. I want to make this very clear, okay? And so the first commandment, according to Judaism, is the declaration, I am Yahweh, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Okay, that's the first commandment. It's not a commandment, it's a declaration. It's the standard introduction to a covenant. In the Middle East, the person who is making the covenant or swearing the oath would um, would introduce themselves first. They would introduce themselves. I am, my name is, uh, is uh, Yehorai. Um, I am the son of Yahweh. Uh, and, you know, from this certain place. And I am making this covenant to be your what? When, when and historically, archeologically, they have found ancient covenants. And this is the standard introduction to every marriage covenant. I am, insert name here, um, who, um, who I guess wants to be your husband or wants to be your wife and continue on. So this first declaration indicates who we should worship and why. We should worship Yahweh because he brought us out of the land of Egypt. Now, I'm not Jewish. Uh, I'm not, uh, I, neither do I consider myself to be Israelite or part of the family of Abraham or any of those things. We'll talk about that in another video. But um, um, the first declaration, I am Yahweh, is I am Yahweh, okay? And so I recognize that he is making a covenant. And so Yahweh is the one who should be worshiped. 
in Christianity and Judaism, this is the statement that everybody agrees, nobody disagrees with this statement. But if Yahweh bought you, it means that you become his, you are his possession. He brought you out. Um, that has the connotation as Judaism believes that Yahweh redeemed Israel. He redeemed Israel. Redeem means to be bought with a price. But everything that is, but think about this, everything that is bought with a price has a service to complete. When you buy a bag of chips, you don't just buy that bag of chips just to have a bag of chips. You buy that bag of chips unless it's a collector's item. Even then, it still has a purpose to be a collector's item. But you buy that bag of chips so that it can be eaten. When you buy a computer, you don't just buy a computer to buy a computer, you buy a computer to use so that you can do work on it, you know, do videos on it, uh, get on the internet with it, uh, you know, and, and download uh, applications and things like that. When you buy a phone, you're basically redeeming the phone and you bought that phone for a reason. This is something that people don't understand because a lot of people say, well, I'm a child of God. I'm a daughter of God. I'm a son of God. But you are redeemed for a reason. So if he redeemed you, then you are his servant. That bag of chips becomes your property. Okay. Um, that computer is your property. If someone redeems you, you are their property. Property. You are their servant. We don't want to think about that. These are the things that since we live in the 20th and the 21st century, People don't understand because they don't know anything about servanthood. You have to be rich to know about service, or you have to be in another country to know about service. In the United States, though, we don't know that much about this stuff. If somebody buys you, usually what would happen is if a person was going through hard times, and this is in the scriptures, and uh, they borrowed money um, from, uh, from someone, they will become that person's slave. Now, the only way that they can get out of that slavery was to be bought. So if somebody buys you, either you are their slave, you are their servant, or you are free, okay? If, if, you are, if Yahweh has redeemed you and he sets you free, you're still indebted to him and you still become his ser servant. Any person who has been bought with a price, who has been bought out of slavery, is usually grateful enough to the person who bought them that they will make that person their master, okay? This is, that's because people back then were grateful for what other people did for them. Don't, now that's not, that's, not, um, that's not how it goes. Now people are entitled to be free. And that's what Christianity teaches. We're entitled to be free. And because we're free, we could do whatever we want. But that's not the case. Either way, whether he redeems you to be his servant or he redeems you to be set free, you become a servant of his. And if he is righteous, you become a servant of righteousness. You were not bought for no reason. You were, you were bought to be a servant, a vessel of righteousness. And so the first commandment declares, first of all, who we are to worship. Second, it declares who bought us. Third, it declares our freedom. He brought you out, he brought the Jews, he brought Israel out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And now because he bought them out, that this is his receipt. Okay? This is his receipt saying, I own you. I brought you out, I own you. Even if Yahweh has brought us out of sin and out of drugs and out of alcohol, we're still bought. We're still um, servants of the one who bought us. And this is not out of obligation. This is out of gratefulness because he did something that he did not have to do. Anybody who buys a servant does not have to buy that servant. 
He does it out of the gratefulness of his own heart. Okay? So, we're clear on that. Christianity will, will agree to all of this. So will Judaism. But then we come to the second commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. And what this means is no one is equal to Yahweh. This is where everything falls apart. This is where everything falls apart. You shall have no other gods before me. That word before means in my face, in front of me. Okay? So this is a big issue in Christianity. Why? Because of the Trinity. They don't put one God in, in, in Yahweh's face. They put two. They say that Jesus is divine. And they put Jesus in front of Yahweh. They say the Holy Spirit is divine. And they put the Holy Spirit in front of Yahweh. Okay? So. He also says, you shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Now think about this. Christianity is clear, especially the Protestants. This is where the Catholics fall apart because they worship all types of images, carved images, images that are made. Christianity says, you can't do that. Christianity is correct. But there's another aspect of this that they're not understanding. It says, uh, okay, and this is the third part. You should not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, Yahweh, am a jealous, is, am jealous, visiting the iniquities of the father upon the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me. So um, you're not supposed to put any um, gods before Yahweh or in the face of, um, or make them equal to Yahweh, you're not supposed to uh, make a carved image and you're not to bow down to carved images, okay? But it goes on um, from there. There are other verses that are not in these commandments and they go like this. The creator is not a man that he should lie. Neither is he the son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said and shall he not do? Or has he spoken and shall he not make it good? Now, see, this is kind of weird. Hmm. This is what, um, what the scripture says about Yahweh, that he's not a man. He's not the son of man. He cannot change his mind, okay? Uh, it says that Yahweh is a spirit. Wait a minute, okay. Oh, and it also says, um, this is the part that I really uh, want to stress. Deuteronomy 4, 15 through 16, take careful heed to yourselves because when Yahweh spoke to you, you saw no form. You saw no form when Yahweh spoke to you at Horeb or at Sinai out of the midst of the fire. Take heed to yourselves lest you act corruptly and make for yourselves a carved image in the form of any figure, the likeness of man or female. So when when Christianity thinks about the form, they think about the, the actual carved idol made out of stone or concrete or metal, something that they, that's shaped with the hand. But Moses makes it clear in Deuteronomy that the people of Israel saw no form. They saw no form. Okay? no form. They didn't see the form of a man. And this is something that you'll see in the later prophets. Isaiah, I saw the form of a man, uh, but he didn't see his face. Ezekiel sees the same thing. Revelation sees the same thing. We're going to talk about that in another time and what that is. 
But Moses says, you saw no form. So if the people saw no form, how can Yahweh be in the form of a likeness of a man or a woman? If Yahweh is spirit, that he cannot be in the form of a man or a woman. I'm making this point and you know where I'm going with this by now. Okay. So monolatry versus uh, uh, monotheism. So monolatry is single worship. It's the belief that there are many gods, but the concentration on one sole deity is not mono, uh, monotheism. Monotheism means that there is only one God in existence, okay? That there are no other gods, there are only one. The first commandment is the recognition of Yahweh as the one that we worship. The second commandment does not deny other gods, though. It only prohibits the believer from worshiping other gods. Very important, okay? I'll say that again. The first commandment recognizes Yahweh, Yahweh as the one that we worship, but there is no statement that says that no other gods exist. As a matter of fact, since we're talking about the first five books of the Bible, there are plenty in, in the whole Old Testament that talk, there are plenty of texts that talk about Baal, Asherah. Um, they talk about El, they talk about uh, Baal Hadad, they talk about all um, um, Murdoch, and it talks about Molech. It talks about all other types of gods. And so in the Old Testament, everyone is forced, with, if you're going to believe that the Old Testament is the inerrant word of Yahweh, word of God, you must, must admit that there are other gods mentioned in the text, even though the text prohibits the worship of those other gods. There is a recognition of these other gods, okay, in the text, okay? So, minolatry. The, the, the Old Testament is a, min is a monolatrous document. Monolatrous document. Meaning, in the text, you can see that there are many gods, that there are other gods that are being worshipped. But the purpose of the text is to tell the believer not to serve those other gods, but to serve only one. The Ten Commandments, therefore, limit worship to Yahweh alone without denying the existence of other deities or gods. So. These are the words of Yeshua himself. He says, Yahweh is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. He says, my father is greater than I. Now, a lot of Christians would say, well, he also said, my father and I are one. But even the scripture says that a man should become one with his wife. Does that mean that the wife is the husband? No. Yeshua says, most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. This is something that we have to understand. And this is something that I stress because it really needs to be said. Why, if Yeshua came to die for our sins, who sent him? He did not wake up one day and say, I'm going to die for the sins of all humanity. He did not send himself. Someone else sent him. And the one who sent him is the one who should be worshipped. Yeshua plainly says in the book of John that, that the father, I'll leave that in quotes, is the one who sent him. And because his father is the one who sent him, then his father is the master and he is the servant. He cannot be greater or equal to his master. Hello, come on now. So the deity of Yeshua, where are we going with this? The first two commandments prohibit the worship of Yeshua. Why is that? If Yahweh is a spirit and Yeshua is flesh, 
he is automatically disqualified from being Yahweh. Hello, Yahweh is a spirit. God is a spirit. So he cannot be God because he is not. Uh, he is flesh. Here's another one. If Yeshua is Yahweh in the flesh, it violates Deuteronomy 4, 15 through 16 because Yeshua was a man. Uh-oh. So remember, when we go back to Deuteronomy chapter 4, it says that when the people of Israel were on Mount Sinai, they did not see a likeness. They saw no form coming out of the fire. So because of that, they should not make images of any kind, especially in that verse, it talks about the image of a man, a male or a female. Deuteronomy specifically says that Yahweh was not in the form of, of a male or a female. Hello. If Yeshua is the word made flesh, the word is created. Where did the word come from? It came from his mouth. It's created. And the flesh of the man is still a created being. So if the word is created and flesh is created and the word became flesh, you went from one creation to another. You just morphed into a different creation. But the word being created, think about this. The word that comes out of a person's mouth is created by that person. I'll say that again. The word that comes out of a person's mouth is a created, is, cre is a creation of that person. And so even the word of Yahweh, the word of the creator is created because it came from the creator. So the word is a creation and flesh is a creation. They're both creations. They are not worthy to be, they are disqualified because Yahweh is a spirit. If Yeshua is a second person, it violates Deuteronomy 5 and 7 that no deity should be equal to the creator. Either way you put it, Yeshua should not be worshipped. And, well, that wasn't the first commandment. That was the second one. I, that was an error on my part. So the second commandment prohibits the worship of Yeshua. We're going to continue. If Jesus is a divine figure, he cannot be equal to Yahweh because Yahweh, because that would make Jesus a second divine figure okay so where is this divine figure gonna be well christianity says oh he sits at the right hand of god well he's still in the presence of yahweh that word before can either mean in the face of or in the presence of the proximity of you there's no one who can compare to yahweh he cannot stand in the face of Yahweh. Yeshua cannot stand in the face of Yahweh. He cannot sit at the right hand of the Father. No deity should be before his face or in his presence. The Holy Spirit will be considered a third divine being and forced to follow the same rules. Why is that? That is because of Isaiah 45. Verse 18, it says, for thus says Yahweh that created the heavens, the creator himself that formed the earth and made it, he has established it. He created it. He did not create it in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. He says, I am Yahweh and there is none else. The reason why no one can stand in the presence of Yahweh is because Yahweh is the creator. And because he is the creator and the sole creator, no one can measure up to him. Everything and everybody that exists was created by him.
everything, everything. So verse 23, uh, Isaiah 45, verse 23 says, I have sworn by myself, the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Hello. Every knee must bow to the creator and every tongue shall swear to the creator. Everybody must recognize. Even the demons in hell have to recognize that he is the creator and that they cannot do anything to him. If they wanted to come against anything that he wanted to do, they know that they cannot do it. It's only man that thinks that they can be equal to the creator. You can't. You just can't, okay? So um, Yahweh says that because he is the creator, no one can be in his presence. No one can be before his face because, or no one is equal to him because he created them. He is the creator. No one created him. He created everything else. He created every spirit. He created every flesh. Okay? So no one can stand before him. No one is equal to him. All right? Yeshua cannot be equal to Yahweh because he is, because, um, he is created. I'm sorry to tell you, but Yeshua is not Yahweh because Yahweh is spirit and Yeshua is flesh. Flesh, can, no one can stand equally before the creator. Interestingly, when we look at the different mythologies, the creator was not considered a deity whereas others were created, were, they were considered to be a deity. What makes Yahweh different from all of the other gods? The difference is Yahweh as the creator gives life. Yeshua could not give life. As a matter of fact, Acts says, Acts chapter two says that he, that the Jews crucified him and Yahweh raised him up. Hello, Yahweh gives life. If Yeshua was Yahweh, he would be able to, first of all, he would not have died in the first place. Second of all, if he did die, he would have be able, been able to give himself life, which is impossible because he's dead. Yeshua is not Yahweh. Yeshua is not Yahweh, okay? Make that get that straight. Say it outrightly. Yeshua is Yah is not Yahweh. Yahweh gives life. Yahweh Yahweh is a life giving being. He's not a de he is not a god like all of these other spirits that are moving around. He is not a flesh. Okay, just to make that clear. So, the historical belief on the entity of God. Historically, we've said this before, Yeshua was a Judean Jew. He was from Judea. They were referred to as Hebrews, okay? And among the Judean Jews, absolute monotheism was and still is the de facto Jewish belief. Absolute, monarch, uh, absolute monotheism means there is one God. The Trinitarian belief is not absolute monotheism. There's one God and one person that's indivisible. And this is in the Jewish, uh, the Jewish uh, belief statements also that uh, the creator is one God in one person and indivis indivisible and incorporeal, which means he does not have a fleshly body. 
So seeing that that Yeshua believed that Yahweh was one God who could not have a fleshly body, all of a sudden the Christians are like, oh, Yeshua is Yahweh in the flesh. It's a contradiction of the context to the gospel. So those who walked with Yeshua, with Yeshua were Hebrew Jews of the church of Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 6, it says that there are two groups. There are Hebrew Jews and there are Hel uh, Hellenistic Jews or Greek Jews. The Hebrew Jews spoke Aramaic. They had a certain set of beliefs, but the Greek Jews spoke Greek. They could not say the word, they could not say the name Yeshua. They would say Yesos. And when you look at Acts chapter 11, it is the Greek Jews that, um, that go preaching the Lord Jesus. It is also the Greek Jews that receive Paul. Hello. So Paul is not connected to the apostles at all. And this is the reason why we refuse his authority because he didn't, he was living in the time of the apostles and he did not consult the apostles of, of who Yeshua was. So if he's writing, it's, it's not relevant to us unless it's for historical uh, purposes. Or sometimes you will see me use his writings because he is correctly quoting from the, from the uh, Old Testament. And so there's not a lot of times, though, where he quotes correctly from the Old Testament. We'll see that later also. Okay. And so uh, those who walked with Yeshua were Judean Jews. And the Judean Jews who believed in Yeshua gathered themselves in the church of Jerusalem. The church of Jerusalem was the mother of all churches, but they were known as the Ebionites. We can see this in Romans chapter 15, verse 23, where Paul talks about an offering that's supposed to be brought to the poor saints of Jerusalem. He is talking about the Ebionites. Now, a lot of Christian historians like to say that the Ebionites came out in the second century AD, but there is a lot of evidence that says that um, the that says that the Ebionites were a first century group, namely the Book of Acts, which is a, a huge tall tale sign of the Ebionites in uh, Acts chapter two, it says that the new converts gave up what they had. They sold all of their possessions and set them at the, at the feet of the apostles. Now think about this. It says this two times in the book of Acts, once in, uh, in Acts chapter two and once in Acts chapter four. If they are selling everything that they have and giving it to the apostles, what would that make them? it would make them poor. Ding! I know, mind-blowing. But um, the word for poor in Hebrew is ebion, where we get the word ebionite. All right. So the ebionites historically were Unitarian in doctrine. What does it mean to be Unitarian in doctrine? Unitarian, uh, the doctrine of Unitarianism is the doctrine that, uh, that God is one person, indivisible, um, one person and indivisible, okay? And so remember, Unitarian, Unitarianism was there before the Trinity came, came about. It was the de facto belief of Judaism that, that God was one person, okay? And that he was indivisible. One person, one nature, um, and indivisible and incorporeal. So this is the Unitarian doctrine that he is one person, a single person, um, incorporeal and ind with an indivisible, indivisible nature. So 
all of the Jewish disciples of Yeshua, even the ones that converted after the death of Yeshua, held to the Unitarian doctrine. Even in history, in history, unless they were Gnostic, all Jewish, quote unquote, Christianity um, believed that Yeshua was not God. Um, and that Yahweh was one person and indivisible. The Hebrew disciples of Yeshua were never considered controversial to the other Jewish sects because of who they worship. Now you have to understand if the, if the believers in Yeshua were going around and saying that Yeshua was God and that he was Yahweh, Yahweh in the flesh, all of the Jews would have had a problem with them, okay? But when we look in the book of Acts, the only controversy that we see is uh, between the, uh, with the disciples of Yeshua is with the Sadducees, who did not believe in the resurrection. The believers of Yeshua did believe in the resurrection, just like the Pharisees. And we understand that the Ebionites were a part of Judaism because of Acts chapter 15. It talks about the Sadducees being there. It talks about all of that stuff. Different, the sect of the circumcision. Everybody was there in that meeting, not just the Ebionites, not just the believers, okay? This is the reason why Paul could not do anything. He, in the book of Galatians, he was upset because um, they didn't take away circumcision they didn't um take away uh the requirement of conversion okay from the gentiles so um this is the historical um belief of the believers of the disciples of yeshua now yeshua now we're going to go we're going to get into the nitty-gritty um, I know this is taking a little bit long, but this is about to go a little bit faster now. So the first thing is that Yeshua could not have died for the sins of humanity. Why is that? Um, Exodus chapter 32 is when Moses um, is when Moses um, is praying for the people. Now, the context of chapter 32 is uh is that the people of is moses had gone up the mountain uh, according to the book of exodus and he went up the mountain and the people he didn't come down for a while so the people what they did was they made a golden calf and they said this is yahweh who brought you out of the land of egypt now this is exactly what christians do with yeshua they say this is Yeshua who redeemed you of your sins. He, he, he died on the cross for all of your sins. This is Yahweh in the flesh. So Christianity is repeating the same mistake that is noted in the book of Exodus. Very important. That's very important to notice, okay? Why is that important? It must, it must be noticed because Christianity is doing the same thing that uh that um that the israelites were doing but i'm going to keep going so moses comes down the mountain he sees them dancing and sacrificing before uh the golden calf he gets upset he destroys the golden calf and he says i will go back up to yahweh he says you have committed a great sin so i will go up to yahweh and i will make atonement for your sins but when he tries to do this, he says, he says, I offer myself for their sins. But Yahweh says to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. Very important statement. Moses went to give himself as a sacrifice for the people and Yahweh would not accept it. He says, I will block the person who sins out of my book, okay? So from the Torah, we get this um, idea that 
no one can die for the sins of other people. But there's more. Deuteronomy chapter 24 and verse 16, the father should not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the father. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. Oh, well, it's talking about fathers dying for sons and sons for di uh, dying for fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. You don't believe me? Here's the next one. I'm a, Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20 is the one I really want to get to. The soul that sins shall die. The person who died, who sins is the one who dies. Okay. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the, bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Okay, and then there's another verse, uh, Psalms 49, verse 6 through 8. And it says like this, they that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give a ransom for him. For the redemption of their soul is precious, and it ceases forever so you could say well they're talking about the rich people trying to buy people but still no none of them can by any means redeem his brother nor give a ransom to Yahweh I was looking on the internet and someone mentioned this verse and the Christian stood up and said well a man can't do it, but Yahweh, no one gave a ransom to Yahweh, but Yahweh gave. Yahweh gave his son, or Yahweh came in the flesh. Okay? Here's the deal. There's a reason why the scripture says, the soul who sins shall die. Think about this. Okay? If I sin and I'm about to be put to death and you say, well, he's so young. He has such a life ahead. Of, he has such a great life ahead of him. I'm going to give myself for him. You decide that you are going to sacrifice yourself for me. You die and I stay alive. Now what? There are two options. Either I will be so grateful that I would change my life so that no one else has to die for me, or I just won't care. And I'll keep doing that. And I will learn how to sin, and I will learn how to persuade people to die for me. Now, Christianity uh christianity counts on the first option that i'd be so grateful that i changed my life but in re reality the second part is very much still realistic most christians are the ones who were grateful for the quote-unquote sacrifice of yeshua and they change their lives around. I agree that it's possible. But you can, every Christian can testify that there was someone who just did not care. And they continued in their sins. The soul who sins shall die. The righteousness of the wicked, uh, the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him. And the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Okay? But Ezekiel chapter 3 and, and verse 19, which is the third uh, verse, is important. It says, yet if you warn the wicked and he does not turn from his wickedness, 
nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have saved your soul. So Yeshua could not have died because Yeshua spent his entire ministry and it's recorded in the New Testament preaching to the wicked that they should change their ways, preaching that they should repent, okay? He sent the apostles out. John the Baptist preached that they should repent and, and turn from their wicked ways. So why is it that Yeshua should die or should be blamed for the sin of the wicked? Okay. It's very important to understand that the foundations of the Christian and Jewish scriptures tell us that no one can die for someone else's sin. No one can die for someone else's sin. Okay. Well, you say, well, Yahweh, well, this is why uh, Yeshua is Yahweh in the flesh. So you mean to tell me that Yahweh died? Well, I thought it's impossible for Yahweh to die if he's eternal. If he's the first and the last, how can he die? And if Yahweh died, who would raise him up? It doesn't make sense. But don't worry, the Christians have an answer for that. Oh, it's a mystery. Uh, the Lord works in mysterious ways. When people say those, you have to believe, you have to believe, you have to take it in faith. When people say things like that, it is because they have no answer. Okay? They have no answer. They have no answer. And they have no proof. Once you take out these verses and you show them to them, they won't have anything else. So they will have to result to, uh, well, you have to take it in faith. The Lord works in mysterious ways. We don't understand God. Those types of statements, okay? Just know that when somebody says that, it's over. They don't know what to say. Even if they start in the beginning of the, of the conversation like that, it's over. They don't know what to say. Not only that, but they're not listening to you either. I have a policy against um, talking to brick walls. You guys know the saying, um, uh, it's like talking to a brick wall. Yeah, I, I try not to do that that often. And so you have to move on. So, but the scripture tells us uh, the, the Old Testament tells us that no man can die for the sins of another person. Yahweh, the creator, will hold the person who sins accountable for their sins. The husband cannot die for the wife. The mother cannot die for the children. The parent cannot die for the children. The grandparents cannot die for the children. The children can't die for their parents or their grandparents, okay? Everybody is, is held accountable for their own sin. Moving on. This is going to be entering, interesting. Yahweh never commanded sacrifices. Hmm. Interesting. Let's see what Jeremiah 7 says. It says, thus says Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel, add your burnt offerings to your sacrifices and eat meat. For I did not say to your fathers, nor command them in the day that I brought them out of Egypt concerning burnt offerings. Wait a minute now. What about Leviticus chapter 1 and chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7, chapter 8? Didn't, didn't he command sacrifices? 
I want you to, I want it to be clear that Yahweh is specifically referring to Exodus chapter 32. So now we're going to go back to the golden calf event. Okay. And so since I didn't put it in a PowerPoint, I'm just going to set this here. And as you can see, I'm using Bible Gateway. Um, and so let's read about the golden calf event. Okay. It's, this is Exodus chapter 32. It says, now when the people saw that Moses delayed come, uh, coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, come, make us gods that shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And Aaron said to them, break off the golden earrings, which are in, your, in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people broke off the golden earrings, which were in their ears, and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. Then he said, listen to what he says, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Hmm. Interesting. Verse five. So when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it and Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow is a feast to Yahweh. So now we see first it says, this is your God. But now verse five says, this is a feast to Yahweh. So the indication is that this golden calf was a representation of Yahweh. Let's keep going. Verse six, then they rose early in, on the next day, offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and play and rose up, uh, eat and drink and rose up to play. Now, wait a minute now. Hold on. Wait a minute now. Something is going on here. Something is going on here. As you can see, it says, then they rose early in the morning, offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. Nowhere from the exodus of Israel to this point has offerings been mentioned. No offering was mentioned. But here it says that they did it. So now we go back to Jeremiah chapter seven and Jeremiah chapter seven reiterates that for I did not speak to your fathers or command them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings or sacrifices. So basically Yahweh says, I didn't tell you guys to offer sacrifices. Verse 23, but this is what I commanded them saying, obey my voice and I will be your God and you will be my people and walk in all the ways that I have commanded you that it may be well with you. Yet they did not obey or incline their ear, but followed the counsels and the dictates of their evil hearts. Wait a minute now. So not only is Yahweh saying that he did not command sacrifices, but he is saying that sacrifices are evil. What? How can this be? How can this be? Really? How can this be? especially when you're thinking about Leviticus 1 through 7, where it specifically um, spells out um, sacrifices and how they should be offered. But Yeshua says, makes an interesting statement. 
where he says that Moses allowed certain things because of the corruption in the people's hearts. Uh oh. Of course, not only that, but you guys understand that I believe in the documentary hypothesis. So we believe that uh, the sacrifices, not believe, but we know that the sacrifices are from the priestly, uh, from the priestly text, which to us is a forgery. Before the priestly text was written, which is, it was written during the exile, there were no mention of sacrifices and Yahweh. Those things were not put in the same place. Okay. So let's move on though. Sacrifice and offering you do not desire. My eye, my ears have you opened. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. In other words, Yahweh doesn't want your sacrifices. He doesn't require sacrifices. So if Yahweh doesn't require sacrifices, why is it that Yeshua needs to die for our sins? Hmm. Let's continue. Not only that, but blood sacrifices are not required for the forgiveness of sin. You have verses like in Samuel that says, does Yahweh have a great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices? As in obeying the voice of Yahweh? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to obey than the fat of rams. The creator would rather you obey him than to give a sacrifice. Psalms 51, for you do not desire sacrifices, else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of Yahweh are a broken heart, a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart you will not despise. Sacrifices are not required for the forgiveness of sin people. That's not it. And it's interesting because the majority of uh, the Old Testament text confirms that. But because of a few verses in Leviticus, or one verse in Leviticus, one verse in Leviticus that says that, uh, that the blood is given for atonement, they don't understand that even Deuteronomy, even the scripture says by the, that nothing should be established on one witness. At least two are, are required, more possible. So we'll go in even further. Yahweh hates sacrifices. We get this from Isaiah chapter one. Yahweh says, you know what, better yet, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna pull it up on the um, Bible Gateway. So Isaiah chapter one. And we'll start from verse 10. It says, hear the word of Yah Yahweh, you rulers of Sodom and the law and the, give ear to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says Yahweh. I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand? He's asking them, when you come into, into my presence, who told you to bring that sacrifice? Who told you to do that? Jeremiah chapter seven, Yahweh says, I didn't tell you to do that. Verse 13, bring no more futile or worthless sacrifices. So Yahweh thinks sacrifices are worthless. Incense is an abomination to me. 
the new moon and the Sabbath and the calling of assemblies, I cannot endure iniquity in the sa- and the sacred meeting. This is something I'm going to keep going. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They are a trouble to me. I am weary of hearing, of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear you. Why will he not hear? Your hands are full of blood. He's specifically talking about the sacrifices. Okay. And so Christians will use this and they will say, see, Yahweh does not like sacrifices. Okay. Well, this was written before Jesus. So he didn't like the sacrifice of Jesus either. Isn't that an apparent year? Now, people like to say, like to look at verse 13 and say, uh, the new moons, the Sabbath, and the calling of a semis, I cannot ad- endure iniquity and the sacred meeting. That last part, I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meeting, Yahweh is saying, I can't have them both at the same time. If you're going to have a sacred meeting, have a sacred meeting. But don't bring your sacrifices. If you're going to bring your sacrifices, I'm not going to tolerate the sacred meeting. Your new moons, I hate them. Your appointed feasts, I hate them. Why does he hate them? Because of the sacrifices. They are a trouble to me. Why? Because of the sacrifices. I'm weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Why? Because of the sacrifices. Your hands are full of blood. But wait a minute. Now let's get to verse 16. Wash yourselves and make yourselves clean. Get all the blood off your hands. Put away the evil of your doing from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. And then look at verse 18. After you've done all that, now come and let us reason together says Yahweh. Though your sins are like scarlet, I will make them as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, I will make them like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of Yahweh has spoken. Very famous verse. Very famous verse. But in this verse, Yahweh says, I don't like your Sabbath, your sacred meetings because of the sacrifices. In Hebrews, there's a statement where it said, even the blood of the blood of bulls and goats cannot um, take away sin. And you have to think about that. How can, if I sin, what does that bull or goat do to me? Nothing. It has nothing to do with me. It's not my blood. But if you chop off my hand because of a sin that I've done, that makes sense. If I die because of a sin that I've committed, that makes sense. But for someone who is innocent to die because I'm guilty, has no bearing whatsoever. Let's keep going. And finally, what is the name above all names? I'm going to go back again. And we're going to go to Isaiah chapter 45. Isaiah chapter 45. And verse 18, and it reads like this. For thus says Yahweh, who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who has established it, 
who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited. I am Yahweh and there is no other. I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I did not say to the seed of Jacob, seek me in vain. I, Yahweh, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. Assemble yourselves together and come. Come near together. You who have escaped from the nations, they have no knowledge, who carry the wood of their carved image and pray to a God that cannot save. Tell and bring forth your case. Yes, let them take counsel together. Who has declared this from ancient times? Who has told it from that time? Have not I, Yahweh? And there is no other God beside me. A just God and a savior, there is none beside me. So one of the things that Christians believe is that Jesus is the name above all names, that everybody has to bow to the name of Jesus uh, because he has the name above all names. And this comes from Philippians 2, verses 9 through 11. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to duplicate. And I'm going to take us to Philippians. Philippians 2. Okay. Philippians 2. Remember, uh, okay, so, so the verse is here. It says, therefore, God also has highly exalted him, referring to Yeshua, and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, and those of those in heaven, and of those on earth, and of those under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the God, of God the Father. And because of this verse, everybody says, well, Jesus is the name above all names. The sacred name people say is Yahshua. Yahshua is the name above all names. Other people say is Yahushua. Yahushua is the name above all names. Is Yahoshua. Is Yahoshua is the name above all names. Yahushua. Yahushua is the name above all names. Okay, they get it because of this verse. What they don't understand is that this verse is a quote of Isaiah 45. Okay? Philippians is written by Paul. And what Paul is doing is he is misquoting Isaiah 45. Remember, Paul believed that Jesus was a God. He believed, he possibly believed that Yeshua was Yahweh, okay, just like Christianity does. But what he does is he takes Isaiah 45 and he turns it so that it refers to Yeshua. But what does Isaiah 45 say? At the end here, it says, there's no God beside me, a just God and a savior. There is none besides me. So first of all, Yahweh says, Yahweh says in Isaiah 45 that he himself is the savior. Hello. Wait a minute. It gets even better. Verse 22, look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. He is saying, look to Yahweh and be saved. Wow amazing. Yahweh said that he is the savior, that you can look to him and be saved. Not only that, verse 23 says, I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return that to me, to Yahweh. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall take an oath. He shall say, surely in Yahweh, I have righteousness and strength. To him, men shall come and all shall be ashamed who are in sins against him. And Yahweh, all the descendants of Israel will be justified and shall glory. Isaiah 45 makes it clear that Yahweh is the only uh, creator. He is the only savior. 
his name is the name above every name and that his name is the only name by which men can be saved. Okay. Do we understand that? So this is the conclusion of the matter. Why worship Yeshua if he is not the creator? He is the creation. It is prohibited by the second uh, declaration or the second commandment um, to worship him. His sacrifice was not even necessary. There's no need to worship him. It's prohibited to worship him. So we don't worship him. And so in conclusion, this is the worship doctrine. The Jews, the Christians, and the Muslims worship El, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is not Yahweh. In reality, there are many deities that are worshipped on earth. Moses and the Kenites worshipped Yahweh, the creator, and we worship him and him alone. We believe in minolatry. We we worship Yahweh alone, but we understand that other people are worshiping other gods. Unitarianism, we believe that Yahweh is one being above all else, wholly indivisible and of one nature. We reject the deity of Jesus, his preexistence, his virgin birth, his sinless life, his miracles, his messiahship, his vicarious and atoning death through his shedding blood, uh, through his shed blood, his bodily resurrection, his ascension to the right hand of the Father, and his personal return and power and glory. Basically, we believe Yeshua is a servant of Yahweh. He was a great man. He was a prophet. He was inspired by Yahweh and his moral teachings, but he is not God, nor is he Yahweh in the flesh. He was a teacher in whom the spirit of the word dwelt. And this is it. This is what we believe. We do not believe that Yeshua is God. I know a lot of people are not going to uh, agree, but it's okay. Uh, send your comments and we can talk about it. Uh, feel free to like and share this video. And also, if you are new to the channel, please subscribe. I'll see you again. Until then, you all be blessed.